I've heard that Diana Ross actually kicked you off of her tour because you were still in the thunder. <laughs> Is that true? What happened? <laughs> we want all the juice today. She's like, <laughs> come on. It happened. That's true. Yeah. That was the legendary Empress of Soul confirming the lengths Diana Ross was willing to go, just so no one could steal her shine. It gets even more disturbing when you find out Ross even wanted the little things others had when she was the main act. There was so much rumble every time they tried to put us out of the dressing room. We all were dressing in one dressing room. Me, mm -hmm. the pips, and the band, and everybody. Good and they had enough. dressing rooms lined up for her and the Supremes. From what she said, you'd think the Supremes must have at least been insulated from her mean streak, but it seems they were only suffering in silence. But we were taught at, at home never to air your laundry in, in public. People would stop talking to Florence and I, and they would direct all the questions to Diane. Why? Well, I mean, I finally found out that they were told. When someone has lived their life being one of the most successful people at what they do, it's difficult for most people to see them through the lenses of their shortcomings. But Gladys Knight is not one of those. With just an incredible career as Diana Ross and a pool of experiences to pull from, the Empress of Soul seems to have finally decided the time is right for the lies about Diana Ross's spotless record to be unveiled. When I say Knight is coming to the table with a pool of experiences, I'm not just referring to experiences in the music industry alone. The soul musician has also had several up-close interactions with Diana Ross, to the point that they've shared stages at the same and different points. So you see, if there's anyone out there who can paint a true picture of Diana Ross, she's high up on that list. Speaking of Diana Ross, no one will ever be able to take away the fact that she's one of the greatest performers to have walked the face of the earth. From her singing all the way to her outfit selections, Ross embodied what it meant to be a star. However, this seems to have just been a shell or a costume to cover a more sinister appearance. In the words of almost everyone who had to work by her side at any point in her life, Diana Ross was said to be a difficult person. We would later find out that the description used only just scratched the surface of how bad this woman really was. People who worked under her have alleged that she wasn't exactly the easiest person to please. Claims that were proven by others who worked side by side with her after they also reported that she had a problem of micromanaging everyone and everything around her. The people I'm referring to were her own band member, whom she was said to have forced into taking a back seat in the group, simply because she believed she was better than everyone. This woman is alleged to have been so ruthless in her pursuit of whatever she wanted, to the point that she was willing to have not so platonic relationships with some people around her, just so she could gain momentum over the others. In truth, no one knows the actual reason she had those relationships, but it's undeniable that they influenced her to land the spotlight over the other group members. These are the untold parts of Diana Ross's story that Gladys Knight now believes is time for the world to hear about. The thing about her claims is that she's not just pulling receipts based on her own experiences. There have been several other documented experiences about how Ross might have been one dark, twisted individual on her way to becoming rich and famous. As a fan, there's a good chance you've heard a thing or two about these stories. The difference, however, would be made clear when you realize there is still so much more messed up news about Diana Ross that never made it to the headlines. They were a little snooty acting, especially Diana it was a little snooty acting. Presented as first among equals. In the entertainment industry, several names stand out and need little to no introduction, at least to many millennials out here. And Gladys Knight and Diana Ross are two of those people. But let's help some Gen Zs understand just how big these names are. Let's start with Knight. I said I stay by your side. As someone who spent the vast majority of her life in the music business, Gladys Knight stands out as a great example of the artisan level in the cool continuum. She is incredibly gifted and spent many years honing her craft. Still, the music industry can be demanding. With pressures to maintain success, uphold deals with record labels, and navigate the ups and downs of a career, tensions might fall into place. This woman managed to stay at the top of her game for over four decades. Just like Knight, Diana Ross also kept the flames burning in the industry for several years. Some would even say more than Knight. So it's nowhere near an exaggeration to say that Ross has had a spectacular career. Even by the numbers, it's staggering. 
The Detroit Historical Society says that she sold more than 100 million records, recorded 57 different albums, and had a slew of number one hits and awards to go with them. However, it seems that success might have found its way to her head and has shown itself in the darkest possible way. Diana Ross started out singing in school with a group of neighborhood girls who got together to form an all-female counterpart to the local all-male group, The Primes. They got the attention of Smokey Robinson, who set them on the path to their own recording contract. We'll and Diana Ross? She may have never looked back, but others seem to have fallen by the wayside. The other two Supremes, Florence Ballard and Mary Wilson, recalled a Ross who was always trying to set herself apart from the rest of the group, whether it was by standing on the opposite side of the stage or ditching her part of their would-be matching costumes just before they went on stage. You know, rumors about Diana Ross's relationship with the Supremes are, I mean, they're legendary. We've heard stories that Diana would make the other Supremes change gowns at the last I minute. Never. Turns out she wasn't just like that with her own group members. Other people in her line of work also felt this wrath. Now, the person choosing to talk about it all now is Gladys Knight. Gladys Knight is in a music legends class of her own. On her rise to superstardom, Knight shared the stage with other greats such as the Supremes, but a few years ago, the Empress of Soul shared a story about how Diana Ross had her and the Pips booted off a tour. Knight and her family formed their singing group in the 50s when she was just a young girl. In those early days, the Pips signed to Fury Records. The group toured throughout the South, but things really took off for Gladys Knight and the Pips when they started working with Motown around 1966. Soon, they began collaborating with producers on Barry Gordy's famous label and sold millions of records in the late 60s and early 70s. During their climb, they were chosen to tour with other Motown acts, including the Supremes. As the lead singer, Knight often took center stage with her strong vocals when the group performed. During their early days on Motown, they opened for the Supremes, but it didn't go as smoothly as Knight hoped. We were getting help. And uh, when we got off the stage, we had the same road manager, and he said, um, Mr. Gordy's on the phone for you. Back in 2015, she visited Sway's universe and addressed the infamous rumor about Ross kicking them off a tour. She prefaced the story by stating that she loves to be nice, but she also is truthful. We were on tour with the Supremes, and we were doing colleges and some stuff like that, and we opened for them, she said. Knight stated that one night they left the stage after a hot performance and their road manager said Mr. Gordy was on the phone. They were excited about the call because they wanted to do their job well. So I got on the phone and he said, hey, I hear you guys are doing great out there. And I said, I hope so, Mr. Gordy. And he said, but um, you're giving my star act a little bit of trouble. What's up with that? I said, well, I hope so, Mr. Gordy. He said, but um you're giving my star act a little bit of trouble. You know, what's up with that? I said, we're just doing our thing. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's when Gordy delivered the bad news. Well, I think you guys are coming home. Knight was taken aback, but recalled that right before the phone call, she saw Ross peeking out from behind the upper level theater curtain on stage. She said that the move was out of the ordinary for Ross. He said, well, I think you guys are coming home. Mm. Wow. I said, what? He said, I think you guys are coming home. Knight was surprised because the Supremes were talented and some of the biggest stars in the world. They went home the next day. This experience proved to Knight that Ross was actually going to always do anything to get her way. Little did the Empress of Soul know her own fellow group members in the Supremes had already been suffering from that. Is that I'm a bitch, maybe, if people think that? Now, uh, why do they think that? Why do you? Because I'm I mean, just why like you. I have standards. I, you have a way that you want to run your business. I have standards. I have a way that I think works. With no Motown PR machine to protect her, Ross's stringent demands on employees and partners increasingly became gossip fodder. She was unapologetic. I demand perfection from myself, she writes, and the best possible job from all those around me. Tara Borelli claims that Ross's daughter, Tracy Ellis Ross, worked as her mother's spy, jotting down employees' mistakes in a notebook she carried everywhere. Sometimes this obsession with perfection would spill onto the stage, like it did one day at Wembley Arena when Ross became frustrated with the sound system. She stopped the show, screamed at the crew, and knocked one of the sound monitors off the stage with a kick one reporter later said was worthy of Pele. 
See, at the height of the Supreme's fame, Diana Ross had something special. According to what she wrote in her memoir, Secrets of a Sparrow, she knew exactly how lucky they were to have achieved everything they did while they were still in the moment. While it's easy to know how fortunate you are only when something's gone, Ross wrote that she had always been so grateful to know that she could make her life doing what she loved, singing. But that also life took a toll on her, as well as her relationship with the team, leading to a very explosive fallout, especially because of her relationship with Gordy. The thing about the Supremus falling out is that it happened to them individually, with each of the friends losing touch with Diana along the way, starting with Florence Ballard. As the Supremes, Diana Ross, Florence Ballard, and Mary Wilson became pop idols, beloved for their sophisticated, glamorous sound and look, Motown head Barry Gordy soon made Diana Ross the focal point of the group, thanks to her stunning looks and delicate vocals, which, while not as strong as those of Florence Ballard, gave the group an intentional lack of identifiable ethnicity, which helped them to cross over and obtain success with white audiences. Gordy's championing of Ross caused tension and strife within the group. Florence Ballard, in particular, resented being pushed aside in favor of Ross. In 1967, the Supremes were set to headline a series of shows at the Flamingo in Las Vegas. Ballard was already on what is described as probationary behavior in Tom Adrada's 2006 book, A Lifetime to Get Here, Diana Ross, the American Dream Girl, due to excessive drinking and erratic behavior. When she saw the marquee, Featuring the group's new official name, Diana Ross and the Supremes, Ballard reportedly relapsed into drinking and yelled at both Gordy and Ross. And you could see that she was no longer the girl that she was. She was like devoid of whoever she was. And that was so terrible. She was fired and replaced by Cindy Birdsong. Per biography, Florence Ballard released two solo singles that both failed to chart and the ABC recording label shelved her record. She married a man named Thomas Chapman and the couple had three daughters before separating for a time, at which point Ballard went on public assistance. In 1975, Ballard's life took a positive turn again when she won an insurance settlement, reconciled with Chapman, and began performing again by making an appearance at a concert that also featured the group Deadly Nightshade. However, in February 1976, she was admitted to the hospital and died a day later from a blood clot in an artery at just 32 years old. According to Peter Benjaminson's 2009 book, The Lost Supreme, The Life of Dream Girl Florence Ballard, Ballard's funeral took place at Detroit's New Bethel Baptist Church and attracted over 5,000 people who crowded onto the streets and sidewalk outside the church. It's unknown if Diana Ross was even invited to the funeral in the first place, but she arrived at the ceremony in a limousine, making a grand entrance that was booed by several assembled mourners. Ross's own mother was present as her daughter arrived and reportedly looked very upset with the public's negative reaction. Ross joined Ballard's family in the front pew, sitting directly beside Thomas Chapman, at which point she took his youngest daughter, Lisa, from him and sat the child on her own lap. A photographer took a picture of Ross and little Lisa and published it, making it one of the only publicly available images from the funeral. In 2010, Michael Musto of The Village Voice spoke with writer Mark Bago, who attended Florence Ballard's funeral, about Diana Ross's appearance and behavior at the ceremony. Bago noted that Ross arrived with two male bodyguards and let out a sobbing scream as she entered the church, swooning and appearing to nearly faint. The bodyguards proceeded to carry Ross to the front pew as the assembled mourners gasped in shock and strained to get a look at her. Bego said of Ross's appearance, I have never seen such a choreographed in my life. It appeared to be the worst act of mock mourning that I had ever seen. I was awestruck. He went on to opine that Ross had purposely set out to overshadow Ballard and make herself the center of attention, writing, she won't even allow Florence to be the star of her own funeral. While Diana's role in Ballard's downhill spiral is undoubtedly sinister, she wasn't the only one who felt the effects of Ross's switch up. The third member of the Supremes, Mary Wilson, also got the shock of her life from Ross. They were doing a great job of, of elevating Diane, yes, at, at the expense of the Supremes, or using mm -hmm. the Supremes, which was me. Reports on Wilson's 1986 memoir in which Wilson details where things began to go wrong between her and her once close friend and bandmate. Per Wilson, once the group began having success, 
Ross tried different tactics to separate herself from the group. Wilson alleged that Ross would change her costumes to set herself apart from her and Ballard. During TV appearances, Ross allegedly stood far away from her group members on stage so the camera would pan to her solo. About Diane, that has always been the way she is, period, since she was, since I knew her at, at the age of 13. And that would, that would be, she wants everything herself. Ross alleged starvation for attention was a turnoff for the group. She craved attention, and in her attempts to get it, she could seem almost ruthless, Wilson wrote of Ross. Sometimes she would throw a childish tantrum, then moments later pretend it was all a big joke, that she was just being silly. Her bluntness could be disconcerting and feelings were hurt. We saw Diane's actions as the product of thoughtlessness. As I mentioned earlier, Ross had a relationship with Gordy, which the other group members allege drew a further wedge as Ross and Gordy pushed for a solo career for Ross. Furthermore, Wilson claimed that despite Ross's superstar status, she was extremely insecure. Her haughtiness was just a front, Wilson wrote. Deep down, she believed she wasn't as pretty as the other girls. Ross's insecurities allegedly drove her to crave more attention from men aside from Gordy. Wilson claimed in the book that Ross even tried to seduce her boyfriend. Eventually, Ross left the group for a solo career in 1970 and was replaced by Cindy Birdsong. After making this move to have her own thing, Ross still kept the resentment for her former group members. Talking about Mary during an interview, the singer said that Mary had been singing her songs, specifically highlighting that it was her voice on the tracks and not that of the deceased singer. This seems like a messed up thing to say because for starters, the only apparent reason for things going sideways with the entire group was her need to be the center of attraction. And the second part is that even fans agree. One of these people wrote, for her to say Mary is singing her songs, says it all. She said that as if Mary wasn't even on the track. But even through all of these horrible things she did, there are still a couple of people who don't believe how everything turned out, including the lives of her former group members, was her fault. Case in point is this user who wrote, Diana could be a drama queen for sure and had preferred status from Barry, but she proved herself after she left the group. Florence would have been okay too. Bad luck intervened. Unreasonable as it may be, this user may actually be onto something. To some, I probably seem ready to fight, but that's a misinterpretation, Ross writes. I am simply overcoming my insecurities, which I have been dealing with for years and have learned to cover. The older I get, the better it all feels, but letting it just flow is not yet an easy thing for me, and it never has been. If this protective shell has often made Ross misunderstood in professional life, her confidence as a mother and the pride she takes in her five children are bright spots of Secrets of a Sparrow. As Tara Borelli notes, she is an exceptional parent who is grounded and warm with her children in a way she has never been with the outside world. The greatest gift that my kids give me is the reminder that I'm not so great, Ross writes. I'm just ordinary. Yes, maybe people expected more from her than she was able to deliver, but this does not change the fact that she was out of pocket many times. People on the internet believe this to simply be a byproduct of having an affair with your boss. One of them wrote, when you're sleeping with the boss, you will definitely be the lead singer shame on Barry Gordy. He is wrong for pulling Gladys Knight and the Pips off the tour, and this never ends, it keeps repeating. All of their legacies will live on forever, but it seems Ross's shortcomings might follow closely behind hers. That's it for this video. Goodbye.